My name is Tammy Lee Meyer, and I'm joined by John Husband. Thank you, John, for joining me. Hi, yeah. Hi, thanks for having me. Yes. Uh, so this is a long time coming. We've wanted to connect now for well over a year. Uh, and I, I'm really yes. curious as to your work. Um, but to start off with, I'll just describe a little bit about our process for anyone who may be viewing this later. Uh, I've initiated a, um, a process where John and I are going to share each other's work. Uh, and we've agreed to do three sessions. Uh, one to where this one here, where I'm exploring John's work with Wirearchy. Uh, and... And the next, where he takes the role of exploring my work. And in the third session, we're going to look at where our work intersects. Now, that does not preclude us seeing how our work inter intersects all the way along. Uh, but I just wanted to put that out for people. And thank you so much, John, for agreeing to participate. Yeah, let's, uh, let's get going. Let's, uh, let's talk. Great. So where I kind of wanted to start is that we are in a pretty radical time of uncertainty, challenge, and change. Uh, and in terms of that, I'd love to get your, uh, your perspective on if you think that we can turn things around and get on track. So maybe you can just talk a little bit about, uh, yeah, what do you think about that? Um... Yes, it's, it's no secret that uh, the world is, and each of us in the places we uh, sit and act in the world, are facing a number of uh, concurrent crises that are uh, what I think are called messy, wicked challenges. Uh, in other words, there's a lot of complexity to them, be it climate change, uh, financial system, governance, uh, wars, uh, diplomacy, um, generational issues, economic issues. Um, and in, in terms of can we turn it around, I guess this is where we can get into a, a long and unfolding conversation that will have intertwined threads. What I'll start with is I noticed uh, about three days ago in The Guardian an article uh, that was uh, titled something like How to Stay Calm in an Anxious World. Um, and it was advice from a psychotherapist, uh, or several, um, about societal issues and the levels, the, the very rapidly accelerating and increasing levels of anxiety, uh, febrility, nervousness, uncertainty, um, that are facing and from my uh, walking around which is essentially the work that I do um, I'll, I'll come back to what my work is but it's a lot of just walking around and listening and observing um, is that there's there's a, a very strong qualitative difference today uh, than there was even three or four years ago um, and I just noticed for example as well the front cover of The Economist when I was in the New York airport yesterday had uh, is social, the, the front cover says, is social, uh, social media a threat to our democracies? Um, you know, and there's been a lot written already and it's something I'm paying attention to very, very closely. The everyday, ongoing, incessant, connected flows of information that are streaming through us and around us and all of us uh, and we're transfixed by screens and so on, is having some very, very significant effects on our cognition, our psychologies, our sociology, and our behaviors. I don't want to lose the thread of will things turn around or not. What I want to say is that these new conditions, they, they are arguably very new for most people. Let's say, let's call it 20 years, the graphical user interface followed by the first step of the web followed by what was called Web 2.0, and now an interactive participative web, is a massive change in how we ingest, process, and how we use and what we do with information, including to ourselves. It's also spawning many, many different forms of, and patterns of organizing for different purposes, but 
around purposes or issues or challenges or opportunities. And these new forms of organizing happen in partly ad hoc and partly um, connection based with people that you already know or loose ties in networks that form over time. All of these things are very, very new. And at the same time that we're facing these significant crises, which are a uh, and reporting on which is a significant part of the uh, information flood, including disinformation and misinformation and what is colloquially called fake news, at the same time that there's that flood of information and the crises are very, very real, people are having to learn how to interact with information and, e and with each other in very different ways than they ever have before. Um, and that's all come at us, let's say, just in the last 10 years since, since the web got interactive, pretty much. So is there cause for optimism? Uh, maybe. <laughs> what I think is sure is that there are going to be some pretty significant uh, intensifications of crises on the planet. That seems a given. And that the existing systems and structures will continue to be revealed as less and less adequate, if not obsolete. And that there will be more and more people that will be forced in one way or another, either through passion or through necessity, to start grappling with how should we do things now. Um, and that will just be a unfolding process that will happen at different paces in different places. Uh, sometimes it may be global, sometimes it may be national, sometimes it may be around something like uh, Catalonia. Um, it might be due to some kind of economic crash because people are starting to say, geez, this, this optimism in, in the face of really just printing money for the last 10 years is starting to become uh, dangerous. So, is there cause for optimism? Well, even if really terrible things happen to the planet, there will still be some humans left, probably. And humans are tinkerers and um, keep going and adapting. So, this what we're facing now is just really new conditions that we don't know what to do with, and we're having to practice and learn. And some of that's really ugly, and some of that's marvelous. Mm -hmm. um, I think to be a human, you have to be optimistic because, you know, most people have children and grandchildren and so on. Um, but there's a lot to be pessimistic about as well. And I, I just don't know what's going to happen. And I don't know if anybody does. Exactly. And uh, thank you for that, that sort of overview. Um, I, I feel that. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I see it all around me, friends and uh, overhearing conversations on the street, uh, watching people walk through airports or parts of downtown. Yeah. And part of what I'm, I'm so excited about in terms of this process is starting to kind of take some of that agency into our own hands uh, in terms of, yeah. I want to hear uh, reported or in available media what people are talking about in their living rooms and coffee shops, right? Uh, because the, the dialogue that's happening in the public sphere is, uh, is in, it's, it's not represented, uh, it doesn't represent what people are actually talking about. And that's very curious. Yeah. To me. I, think I think people are, if I can interpret and maybe synthesize a bit about your question or your, your observation, I think that um, people everywhere are, what they're talking about and what they're doing in this connected network social media era is that they're trying to understand for themselves what it means to them yeah. first. That's kind of a first step. And what I mean by that is that, <clears throat> Um, I've been reading and thinking about what was called the coming of the information age back when futurists started talking about the information age. So that'd be going back 40 or 50 years. Um, and the, 
the world, due to the increasing presence and the wide range of tools, and particularly electronic systems, information systems that were born, let's say, in the 70s and 80s, started speeding up the exchanges of information. And of course, now it's almost at the speed of light and instantaneous. Um, and, and that has made things very, very much more complex, which I was referring to in the last little uh, uh, bit, that I, bit that I spoke about. What the, what the speeding up does and the omnidirectional nature, possible nature of information flows is that it uh, also increases the felt and perceived complexity a lot. Um, and I think that spawns a lot of polarities and paradoxes. And a paradox that I notice is much has been made about the uh, often shallowness uh, and loneliness, if you will, of virtual connecting. Um, and there's a lot of, there's been a number of books and essays written about before the famous one is uh, Sherry Turkle's Alone Together um, and so on. But what I'm, the, what I want to say ab about that today is that I think something that's very, very important and that's an ongoing thing everywhere, particularly in cities around the world now with, and with perhaps mostly the younger generation, though I hesitate to uh, use that or generations is, uh, and I have a vignette to share that I hope will encapsulate this yesterday. I'm walking down through uh, the West side of central park to uh, Broadway and then down along Broadway to Times Square on my way to uh, get the bus back to the airport. I ended up stopping in Times Square for about 15 minutes and sitting there. And of course, Times Square is one of these places like Piccadilly Circus in London or elsewhere where the world of tourists meet. And I know it's uh, not news that people are taking selfies and so on. But what I noticed is a very, very convivial atmosphere um, and I think that uh, this is a very vague thing. It's, it's going, one of the paradoxes is that the more that we use uh, electronic capabilities, and, and I'm using that in a broad sense because what's coming at us is artificial intelligence and automation and sensors and the Internet of Things and automation and machine learning and deep learning, and so on. So these will surround us and penetrate us uh, and each other. And it, was, it is going to become absolutely essential to understand what it means to you and what it feels like on an ongoing basis to be a human. It's going to force us to redefine that. Absolutely. And, and perhaps relearn it, probably relearn it. Yes, and to learn from each other. Uh, mm -hmm. because this Which is, is your point about, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what you, what you see in this environment about using dialogue and reaching out and presence to, uh, to support that, to accelerate that, to deepen it. Yeah. Uh, well, what in the practice with the global challenges collaboration group, uh, yeah, we had an amazing session that I wasn't a part of, but was able to review some of last night. Uh, and the, the real-time act of sense-making is very powerful because uh, in, in these recorded environments, you can, every, each person can really sense the truthiness uh, um, and, the, uh, and can look at a scenario from a number of different perspectives. What I feel we need to do is we need to learn ways to be able to think together because not one of us has the solution, uh, but our collective intelligence, I think, can help us to uh, be able to know enough to, uh, to push back and to create systems that are human-centered. Uh, that's one of the threads that I, I really have been pulling out from our dialogues and discussions. Right. I think, I think you've put your finger on something that I'm noticing and that's in, uh, incredibly important, I would say foundational or a touchstone as well. So you mentioned the word sense-making and 
and and processes of that, um, and and that is at the core of, of um, maybe I could start over a bit. Uh, you may know of um, uh, a fellow named Dave Snowden. Yes. Um, and uh, Dave, Dave is a friend of mine, and the Kinevin framework has has risen to a, a, a for deal, for adapting to complexity, navigating complexity, has risen risen to a fair bit of prominence over the last decade. Um, and it is essentially based on the uh, core premise that humans uh, make sense by uh, sharing and interpreting stories. Yes. Uh, and he has, in fact, a piece of software that is used to gather thousands and thousands of narratives from people in the face of things like refugee crises or various other challenges. Sorry, go ahead. Um, I'm just noticing a clicking sound in the background. Oh, yes. My pen, sorry. I'm oh, nervous. Yes. Habit. yes. Um, I, was, I was getting wound up, so. Um, uh, there, there's... It, there's a, a link that, or if anyone wants to look it up, it's called SenseMaker Suite. And it's a little, it's a, now a mobile app with a triangle. And for different issues, there are three um, descriptors at each of the corners of the triangle, which would be sort of the core descriptors of the uh, issues in, in the narratives. And you signify by putting your finger where you think it is relative to those three attributes or descriptors. And that goes into a database, and then you can produce visual analytics to look at the complexity of problems or, or issues or whatever else is under study. The other thing I'm noticing that reinforces, uh, I don't think it's a belief, I believe it's a fact that, uh, wait a minute, I believe it's a fact. Okay, anyway. <laughs> um, it, the notion of stories feels right to people because it goes back to how we've communicated ever since we stopped grunting and found language. Um, which is, you know, there's a lion over there or, uh, you know, those people make bigger fires than us. What can we learn from them? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And what I've noticed as well is a book that I, you've, you've probably read it. It seems like everybody has, and it's been incredibly popular in the last couple of years, is the book uh, Homo Sapiens by uh, uh, Yuval Harari. And he's written a more recent book called Homo Deus, which is, uh, men as gods uh, looking to the future but I've been you know just in the last week I've noticed in subways or in airplanes or elsewhere 10 people reading it and a lot of the people I know have read it and in it he premises that the way that we humans began or, or what underlies all human progress and our shared experiences is stories this is what has enabled us to differentiate ourselves from other animals is creating a narratives as to what we might want, want what we might do, uh, how we might do it, uh, and so on. So sense making is a big, and, and then this ties, I think, directly. Excuse me for yapping so much. It ties directly into where we started about ten minutes ago, in terms of everybody's confused, everybody's jangly, everybody's wondering when is this going to stop? Well, it's not going to stop. It's not going away. Yes. Yes. And so it, for me, I, there's, there's something that I'm looking to back into and be with, which, yes, it's about a narrative, but it's about living our truth within that and, and from living our truth to create a new way of being that then has a narrative that comes out of it. Maybe that didn't make sense, but... Um, no, I think... It I think it does what it what it left me with. Sorry, go ahead. You wanted to say something more? Yeah, for me, it's about telling a new story by living a new story. That's clearer, right? So we have, we've got our challenges. We've got these things that we need to look at and understand and make sense of. There are actions that we can take. Uh, and what I'm excited about is a, a real-time documentation with uh with allies and collaborators to work towards those uh, systemic change uh, interventions that we can do to help to shift. And part of it is understanding. And part of it is uh, real actions in terms of economic change, climate change, and these uh, big ticket items that affect all of us. Well, I, I think, yeah, the way I guess I would distill uh, 
what you've said for me, for my interpretation is all we can do in the face of these challenges um, to probably not solve them, but manage them as best we can is to uh, keep talking with each other about them in uh, as constructive uh, a way as possible. Um, what came up for me when you were saying that too about living your narrative and, and so on, I think that's very, very important to do. And I want to raise a sort of a potential red flag there. Um, and not particularly about, about what you said, but we're also in an era where for 20 or 25 years, maybe longer, I can I remember, we have been being told ever since the social contract of yore began breaking down, that we should want to find our purpose, find our passion, live our passion, do our values, et cetera, et cetera. You know, do what you love and the money will come. All of those things I agree with in a very general way. Those, those are also when misinterpreted or interpreted in a particular type of culture, recipes for selfishness, um, and for missing the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And there's an awful lot of that about, I would say. Um, so for example, if we take today's world, a lot of the people we know are similar minded, similar valued to you and I, but there's obviously a whole bunch of people out there <clears throat> who, you know, just to pick out some stereotypes like toting guns, and voting against abortions and um, all sorts of things that are anathemistic to us. And in a sense, they will believe as strongly as you or I believe that they are living and constructing their narrative and being who they think they should be. So one of the questions I would love to see answered on an ongoing basis on a global basis somehow, and I think this is sometimes what some kinds of art or other uh, viral object movement things do, is address the question that I think is an age-old philosophical question, how ought we to live? Yeah. Yes. Which calls forth the notions of love and moral uh, duty and all those things that and, and, you know, there's lots of people feel that it was a lot better 30 or 40 years ago. Part of that's pace. Part of that is more patriarchy and more authoritarianism in soft forms like the church or the military. Or, you know, if you, you only have to look at Mad Men, the TV show, to see what things were like 50 years ago. So... Um, yeah, yeah. The, we, we, we have to keep talking. <laughs> yes, we do. So what I'd love to do a little bit of a dive into is where you have, you know, obviously we want to talk about hierarchy, but maybe what you can do is just give a little history of you are a futurist. Uh, you're, you've, uh, and you've brought some pretty seminal work to uh, the commons, as it were. And so, first of all, I'd love to hear what kind of brought you Tell us a little bit about your journey of how you came to design and develop the concepts of hierarchy. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one of the, maybe I'll start by saying <clears throat> I probably annoy a lot of my friends and people I would call, you know, advocates or allies by, um, being reluctant or maybe you know in a, in a less nice way some some people would say sometimes i think it's called humble bragging um which is you know being passive aggressive in a sense about something you've done that other people recognize um it's only very recently uh, honestly sincerely that i would that i have considered myself to be some kind of futurist i will however admit to wanting to be a futurist and being very attracted to futurism and being a futurist a long time ago. And, and what I have done for the last 30 years is mostly read, 
wander around, observe, uh, and so on through a series of what I would call failed previous careers. Um, so I joke sometimes that, you know, ever since I started working full time after university, I've never had a job that I liked, which is true. Uh, do I like what I do now? Yes. Do I know what it is that I do now? Not really. Um, but so my path to hierarchy is I studied uh, sociology and psychology and philosophy in university. I had been brought up in a pretty knowledge intensive or a family that uh, knowledge was a, and curiosity were very high values. Both of my parents were uh, academics and uh, really interesting people. Um, so I was kind of a free thinker um, and maintained the free thinking through university, swore up and down I'd never work in business. Graduated from university, shortly thereafter needed the money to pay a rent, uh, and ended up being a management trainee for one of Canada's big, uh, five big banks, the Toronto Dominion Bank. So the, all of a sudden I was a banker, and the year before I'd been a hippie. Wow. <laughs> and I worked as a banker for, well, I think about six years. Um, back then, you know, you get promoted or so every year, and I was... And I remember the day I quit, and I quit very, very suddenly when I kind of just went, well, what the hell am I doing this for? I have pretty left-wing socialist values, and, you know, just anyway, I quit. And I went from uh, being a banker to thinking about, you know, what did I want to do with my interests in university? And I ended up working uh, for the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Mm doing, this would be 30 years ago now, and this is uh, interesting in the context of today, uh, doing seminars, delivering seminars uh, for organizations under federal jurisdiction, so banks, airlines, um, telecommunications, uh, all of the government departments and so on, about sexual harassment, about discrimination in employment, uh, and so on and about uh, equal pay for work of equal value. But most interestingly, uh, in today's light of today's things, about sexual harassment in the workplace and so on. So I got informed about that quite early on um, and also came from a, a very egalitarian marriage family. Um, so it's been a... Um, and I've been, I guess, some form of activist ever since then, ever switching away from, from being banking... Uh, so that was an interesting jig into another area. And then after that, after I did that for about four years, I became a management consultant for human resources and or organizational effectiveness, a global consulting firm. Um, and it's there that I learned all of the methodologies, practices, and rules for creating org charts and hierarchies and management protocols and what performance management is all about and all that kind of stuff. All of the things that go with today's modern organizational hierarchy, uh, vision, values, objectives, uh, leadership, and so on and so forth. Um, and it was uh, that I did from the 1984 through to about 1996. And that was just the start of the web. Mm. And I am old enough to have remembered that my first job as a banker, we didn't have any computers. Now, I've been paying attention to the sociology and psychology of organizations ever since that fateful time in university. And I kept on reading futurists. Remember, I said I wanted to be a futurist. And so on and so forth. So I kept reading and I was starting to go, oh, wow, this computer thing is going to really change work. Yeah. And then along came integrated information systems. And then after that, the graphical user interface and then the web. And then it started getting really, really interesting. And it was also exactly at that time that the company I worked for, I was living in London at the time, nominated me to become a partner, a global partner. And uh, three weeks later, I quit because I kept thinking, well, if I was in my early 40s, if I do this for another 20 years, 
as a partner, what you have to do is sell big projects based on the methods that are used at this firm and or or in this field of this area in HR. And I was beginning already to realize pretty clearly that the methods were out of date. They did not foresee the information era. They were all based on the industrial economy and, and so on. And I, by that time, I was kind of hooked on the information ages coming, so I quit, which was a terrible time in my life. My life exploded. Uh, I went into a very uh, deep depression because I didn't know who I was, what I wanted to do. I'd just spent 15 years building up my identity as a management consultant in order to become a partner, and I turned my back on that. Um, and that was around the time that Web 2.0 was just being born. Right around 2000, 98, 98. Yep. Well, it was in October 1999 that I coined the term hierarchy. Okay. After reading a couple of articles and a light bulb went on, uh, and it's essentially taking the word wired, like the magazine, and chopping the D off and saying, we lived in a wired world, what's the archy? What are the, the rules, the principles for living in a wired world? So hierarchy. Um, that was... Uh, October 19th, 1999, so 18 years ago. Um, and it's taken, it's only the last couple of years, I guess, that the term has started to uh, move around quite a bit and become a bit better understood. I've had uh, hundreds of people ask me to be more specific about what it is. And I thus far have been kind of coy about that on purpose because I think it's just a definition of uh, a, a principle or it's a name for the ongoing evolving configurations of uh, organized and purposeful groups of people, uh, which is essentially what organizations are today, absent the sort of structured caste system of the hierarchy. Um, and as to what is happening to hierarchy in today's connected world, where well, we're learning more and more about that every day, I'm a person who believes some hierarchy is necessary, and some kinds of hierarchy but with a different value set and full of philosophy underneath the actions of the hierarchy. So, yeah, maybe we can dive a little bit more into that, uh, just in terms of is it a hierarchy based on, on process rather than the, you know, specific roles in an organization? Or, yeah, how do you see... How, what I think it is I think it is fundamentally process based. The working definition of uh, hierarchy is quote unquote a dynamic two way flow of power and authority based on knowledge, trust, credibility, and a focus on results enabled by interconnected people and technology. So if you parse that or you unpack that, what is always going on between people when they're doing business, when they're doing anything, is they are exchanging their stories and listening to each other. And so they are, in a sense, honoring power and authority. This plays very much into what was a field in the 70s called transactional analysis. Hierarchies are very much a parent tells a child what to do, and the child respects the hierarchy and obeys the parent. Whereas in a hierarchy or a commons or a group of peers or a dialogue group, it's an adult talking to another adult and they agree or disagree with respect to the limits of the kinds of uh, respect that they share because we all know that we don't like talking to people that don't respect us and we like talking to people where we feel respected and vice versa. Yes. And that's where we learn more deeply. Um, and so on. So, um, mm. I, I, yeah. That's, yes, thank you. It's, <coughs> I love uh, what it is to, it, it feels like we are in the process of doing exactly what you are talking about in terms of that information exchange. So I'm just having some insights in being in it uh, witnessing and participating at the same time. Yeah, and I like to think, uh, I mean, it's all, all the rage now. It's very fashionable to, for example, the Economist cover to dump on social media, and it's very fashionable to hate Facebook. 
for example. Um, and I disagree with, you know, Facebook's sort of business ethos. Um, and yet, um, Facebook is one of the best examples of, and, and the effects of Facebook, one of the best examples of hierarchy in action, both in positive and negative ways. Hierarchy is a neutral term, the sword that can cut both ways, because there's, uh, you know, dark and negative aspects to it, and utopic, marvelous, opportunistic, optimistic possibilities from being connected. You and I both belong to, I guess, probably closed groups uh, in Facebook that are like the Global Collaborations Challenge or others, or the commoning uh, initiatives of Michelle Bovins and Salvatore uh, or Stacco, Troncoso, and all sorts of other people. Um, and um, there are people as well, um, lots of people that use Facebook for, for entertainment or shallow purposes. I tend, because it's my personality, I guess, to post relatively serious or articles to, to serious links or issues that I'm concerned about or that I'm uh, being moralistic about or whatever, or scolding people about or scolding myself about. Um, but they, but often enough, they tend to generate some pretty interesting long conversations with a bunch of other smart people from around the world. And I think it's a responsibility of all of us to try to role model online visual text in boxes, listening to other people exploring, saying, can you say more about that? Or uh, I respectfully disagree and here's why, but you're not a dumb person, and, you know, on and on and on. And, and that's what I mean by we're going to have to use these tools to shape public opinion. Back to your initial question about am I optimistic or not? Well, sometimes yes and sometimes no. Yes, it, uh, it, it definitely for me can be overwhelming. But the more that I uh, connect with others who I, as you say, trust is so important. Uh, not only in terms of how we talk together, but just to know that we're not alone. In, in looking at this and seeing the level of, of thought and development and consideration that people give to these uh, challenges is it really, that really helps me. Yeah, of, of, uh, what, what that brings to, I, I agree, what that brings to mind for me is, uh, as you know, uh, I live in Montreal uh, and I used to live in Vancouver and I still have a place there and I'm an Anglophone, but I live mainly in French here. And uh, I decided to do that about 20 years ago, decided to start learning French. Um, there is a pertinence to what you just said here. I believe that what we're going through with the web and learning to learn and learning to dialogue and learning to use it for constructive purposes is very much like the process I and other people will go through to learn another language to a level of proficiency uh, in the sense that you fumble a lot at the beginning, you're either shy or mad at yourself or whatever. Uh, and in my case, I made a very clear decision that I'm glad I lived by, that every time I would go out of my apartment into Montreal, I would speak French. And when you start doing that long ago, when my French was really crappy, 90% of people here respond to you in English, even if they're Francophones. But if you keep going in French, then they go, oh, okay, he wants to learn French. And then they turn helpful, and it's a great icebreaker and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> um, but also I've noticed over the years, you go through plateaus. You know, like 15 or 20 years ago, if I spent the entire day speaking French, at the end of the day, I would be totaled, just wiped out. It takes a lot of energy, a different kind of attention and curiosity. And that's, I think, not unlike what's going on with the web now. But we get more fluent. I mean, the way I interact with people on the web today is I like to believe much more nuanced, sophisticated, and respectful than it was 10 years ago. Even though I don't think I was a knob 10 years ago, uh, I'm probably less of a knob today than I was then. <laughs> uh, so in terms of, of our roles that we play, because yes, I really appreciate what you're talking about, about, about learning. And it's a perfect example to, to your experience with learning French. 
these are our, you know, this is the language of how we will re-socialize yourself as ourselves collectively, as you kind of talk, started talking about it at the beginning of our session today. Uh, well, and in fact, using video, if you think of your introduction to it and what you, the process that you've crafted and that you introduce people to, it is a form of grammar using video. Yes. As is dialogue on a Facebook comment thread, as is using Instagram to tell stories or, you know, uh, all, all of these are new forms of symbols and grammar that we're using to make sense and construct meaning. Yes. So I'm curious in terms of what role you feel uh, I mean, I think I've heard that you're definitely a learner and you're willing to, you know, be an example, uh, you know, and testing and kicking the tires of things. But I'd love to hear what you see your role as in terms of the transformation of systems and where we are at today. Gee. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't really know, um, you know, in, in a sense, your question is one I'm reflecting on a lot. And for example, I went down to New York uh, just to meet a guy who's, uh, you may or may not know, his, his name is Dave Gray. Do you know that name? I do he's know a, the name, but I'm not. Visual thinking, and he just put out a book called Liminal Thinking. Yes. Um, yeah. And he's asking me all those sorts of questions, as are many people, which is, you know, you have the, this, this word is kind of out there. You have some profile. What do you want to do? Because uh, depending upon how much people know me, I'm kind of, um, I guess I'm still the free thinker that I was when I was 17 or 18 because I don't work very much and I wander around a lot and I kind of adopted simple living in order to be able to afford that, but I still have a, kind of a, a nice life. Um, and I'm hitting kind of er early old age. And so the, I, it's a question I often pose myself because I'm, part of me wants to get really busy and make a lot of change. Uh, there's a great deal said all the time. There's some wisdom in, you know, getting clear about what you want to do and having intention and having purpose and so on. On the other hand, life has also taught me that there's an awful lot that's either unconscious or random mm -hmm. uh, that can be related to who you are and how you are being in the world. Um, and I think part of my role is the way I would encapsulate it is I'm just kind of Mr. Wirearchy, you know, I'm, uh, that's what people now say, you know, I'm, I'm known for. And in a sense, I think I'm trying to emulate what that means in the world, which is a, a mix of being both interesting and interested online, role modeling behaviors as best I think I can, and also going out into the world. A lot of, you know, when I travel, I meet an awful lot of people that are, uh, it's been fascinating to me, the people that I've met that are at sort of at the core of blockchain initiatives and commenting initiatives and organizational change initiatives and and most of it honestly and i think humbly just comes from the fact that i made up a word now because of my background i knew what it meant when i made it up it's just that it's taken a long time for for it to anyway so um you know being in early old age uh, i like traveling i i'm still fairly athletic. I swim and ski a lot and I intend to keep swimming and skiing and traveling and doing a bit of work and meeting interesting people and hopefully uh, adding a bit of value as I go along the, that path. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your humility and how you model that, but I'm going to push you a little bit and say, uh, uh, we all have superpowers. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say your superpowers are? Um, <clears throat> and I'll just preface that a little bit with part of what I see is that we've, um, due to this hierarchical 
uh, being told uh, being told how to be. Many of us are uncomfortable with saying what we're really good at. Yeah, yeah, I'm not uncomfortable with it. I'm just thinking about it for a moment. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. So, um, so given given your your addendum of um, that, so I was I was a pretty smart kid. I learned to read uh, by myself at the age of three. I skipped three grades. I was in university at uh, 15. Um, and, you know, I, I read a lot and I have endless curiosity. I still do. Mm -hmm. um, I was brought up in a household where uh, books, were, books uh, and ideas were highly valued. Uh, I would say my, my superpowers are um, what I call very uh, high-level pattern recognition coupled with, for a man, and may, um, a pretty good handle on an ability to access my emotions, which leads to intuitions. Okay. So I would say that, for example, coming up with Wirearchy 18 years ago was a combination of a lot of reading and curiosity about the sociology and structure of organizations and organizational development work and learning and adult development and on and on and on, coupled with an intuition that something really freaking big was happening. Yes. And that, I, and that I should pay attention to it. So in that, in paying attention to it, I would, I'm, I'm just really grateful for you to participate in this. And I'm really curious to uh, see if you'd be interested in reaching out to some of your people that you have good, that you are inspired by and have uh, complementarity with in terms of your work um, to explore this, this type of um, co-creative sense making, uh, both in the one-to-one -one personal sense, but also in larger groups. So in the Global Challenges Collaboration, uh, as I mentioned, the, the session from uh, the, uh, I think it was the 2nd of, of November, it was really powerful me, for me to review and to watch how much knowledge, uh, well-articulated knowledge and work and assessment and uh, observation was happening in collaboration while people were bringing their work as well and bringing what they have to the table. So I, um, I guess I'm, I'm curious to see if you would be interested in in your own way, in kicking the tires on this kind of information sharing, commons building, and sense making process. So, Cedric, you mean uh, thinking about and referring other people to you for conversations like this? No, I'm oh. I'm I'm hoping that you'll choose to do this yourself. Well, I think I guess what I, my my first reaction to that is when I talked about emulating stuff, I think I am doing that in my travels and in my own conversations one-on-one. -on -one, and I think I have been doing that for the last 10 years, Yes. which is probably why I'm, you know, known and have networks uh, of friends. And what I'm finding these days is, uh, and I'm getting an enormous amount of real pleasure from is that I'm, that's another super power I have. I'm, I'm, pretty good at connecting people who should be connected but are not yes. um so i think i'll just but but in terms of recording a dialogue with other people and using that as a way to disseminate i'm i'm not sure i'd be very good at that well uh, but i'll but i'll give it a thought and maybe i'll get you to coach me well, we'll test that out in, in our next session where you're, you're leading me in this kind of dialogue. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, for me, as I'm, as I'm co-designing this with people, where I really uh, would appreciate help is in having feedback in, uh, and, and in guidance, in okay. particular for, from someone who has... You know, you've been in this for a long time, John, uh, and you know a lot of people who are at a pretty high level of development themselves. And 
as you say, your superpower, one of your superpowers and hierarchy within that frame is to connect people. So um, there are many, many ways in which that any of us can help both in sense making, in participating in dialogues and connecting people and helping to put these pieces together. So yep. any of those things. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, if you um, keep doing, for example, one of these with interesting people every week for the next 10 years, there'll be another 500 plus um, interesting conversations for people to reflect on. Yeah. Shall we uh, set a date and time for the next one offline or do you want to do that now? Or Sure, let's just, maybe we can wrap up in terms of what are your next steps for yourself? Uh, uh, in terms of where you're at and where you want to go. What can help you? Uh, part of this is to make it explicit how uh, we can each be helped in, in the ways that we're looking to progress um, a transition of systems and, and learning of the human ways of knowing and being to be able to do that. Uh, so what kind of engagement would help you? Uh, what next steps do you see for yourself? those questions well I'm kind of looking now six months to a year at a time and um, I have a couple of interesting projects that are um, under consideration or on the go one that maybe is an answer to more specifically to your question is sometime in the next couple of months there will be published uh, a very large website uh, titled the 21st century which is the work of a um, an elderly man here in Montreal who's kind of like a modern shaman as far as I'm concerned. And I've been his protege and his, he, he's a real futurist. <laughs> I've been his protege and his um, translator for the last four or five years. Uh, so the, the, for every reader in French, the site exists in French already. Uh, there's like 20 readers in English. So that will be, when it's published, I'll be cited as a co-author and translator, and that will be very good as a foundation for my next 10 years as a, let's say, a minor league influencer or something. Mm -hmm. um, and other than that, I'm waiting on a couple projects. As I mentioned, I'm trying, I, well, I have pretty much found my own rhythm in life, so I'm planning on a couple weeks of skiing in Switzerland in the late January, and uh, maybe a trip to Cuba sometime in the next three or four months and, you know, a few other things like that, staying in shape. Good, good. Okay, well, I very much look forward to our next session, which we will organize offline. Um, and thank you for the work that you do, John. Uh, I, I very much value people that have been in this for some time and the insights that you bring through decades of thinking and development and consideration of other people's work. So thanks so much for all you bring. Thanks. And, and as I said at the, at the outset, I, I mean, nobody is more surprised than me because I've, you know, turned my back on three sort of more conventional careers without any particular objective I don't think other than my curiosity and my intuition and, and literally hierarchy is a made-up word that came to me in the shower but it's you know it's kind of occupied my waking hours for the last 18 years now well as much as I can do to help to support you I'm happy to do as well thank you very much Tammy thanks so much and until next time Cheerio.